the third presentation that we just had um, by Abhin Kumar Mishra uh, presents the Adornian uh, idea of negative dialectics and uh, the problem of addressing uh, the Jew um, and also the, the problem of, of uh, the temporal subject, qua object, uh, in relation to transcendence and, and non-identity. So we now move on to the, to the second session of the day. Um, and the first uh, lecture is by Shomik Gay. Um, Shomik is, he's done his PhD from the School of Arts and Aesthetics. And uh, his work is on, is on religion and uh, relations concerning theater and law and faith and reason. Uh, over to Shomik, his, his paper is called Comedy and the Limits of Materialist Imagination in Christian Religion. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, am I audible? Uh, firstly, I should uh, thank Babu and uh, Shomu for giving me this opportunity to uh, talk uh, about part of my work that I've been trying to do for the last two, three years, which is also part of my uh, PhD research work. But at the same time, uh, I must say that it is uh, it is a bit uh, daunting to talk, to bring something like comedy to the table, where the the, the topic of the the, 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 type, the topic of our seminar is so uh, absolutely serious, and I mean it by the very uh, and I mean it literally that that the, the, the seriousness of uh, thinking the void has been something which has marked uh, Western philosophy and also Indian philosophy, but Western philosophy since its beginning. And if you if you uh, if you arguably say that philosophy in the West begins with Parmenides, then Parmenides' poem, the, the famous uh, poem of uh, the fragments which are available, uh, there is a line that uh, that, uh, that, 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 that there are two parts. One, uh, the way of what it is, and that what uh, the, the way of what it is and what cannot not be, that is the path of being. And then there is the way of what it is not and must not be, which is the path of the void. And the path of the void has to be avoided in that sense, uh, to follow the path of being, which is the path of philosophy. So in that sense, the problem of the void is central to the problem of thinking, philosophical thinking. And to that extent, it is absolutely rigorous to have a seminar on the void. And it is absolutely scandalous to, I mean, uh, probably, to bring something like comedy uh, to the table uh, of, uh, of, of, of about a seminar which is on void. But I want to risk this, uh, this, uh, this major uh, because uh, because you see, there is something very tricky about the comic. Uh, before you know, the joke's over and only the fool is left laughing in the room. Uh, so it is, uh, it is this uh, intense, it is this incredulity of comedy, this, this moment where uh, comedy is something which is transient, which is always transient. But at the same time, as we shall try to show, that there is a difference between this, uh, uh, because the joke is always a transient thing, it is, it is always something which comes and it goes, hence the joke is always over. But comedy is also about stretching this moment. It, it is a question of uh, elaborating on a joke. Uh, it is a question of elaborating. The structure of comedy is fundamentally different than a joke because it stretches the joke. Hence it is so difficult to do stand-up comedies because it basically accumulates a whole collection of jokes. So anyway, the problem of comedy is also the problem of stretching. And this paper is in a sense an attempt to intellectually stretch the, 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 the question of this ineffability of comedy, this ineffable, uh, what I would call a discontinuity, which is the very structure of comedy, uh, through the scope of this paper. So, uh, so the, the title of this paper is Comedy and the Limits of Materialist Imagination in the Christian Middle Ages. This paper has three sections. In the first section, we try to introduce 
the problem of the comet from a theoretical perspective. The two following sections would try to elaborate on that problem, taking up two historical examples from medieval waste. So let us first set up the problem of the comet in relation to the theme of this conference, identity and void, necessarily through a joke. It is a joke found in the 1939 comedy film by Ernst Lubitz titled Ninochka. And the joke goes like this. A guy goes into a restaurant and says to the waiter, Coffee without cream, please. The waiter replies, I'm sorry, sir, but we are out of cream. Could it be without milk? In many ways, the mechanism of this joke essentially captures the fundamental problem of comedy. Though joke and comedy are very different in their structural elaboration, it not only plays around the, around the paradox involved in the word without, which literally means with absence of, which opens up interesting and funny logical linguistic possibilities, like coffee with absence of cream would be quite something different from coffee with absence of milk. But it does something even more. We find here a gesture, a palpable verbal act by the waiter of non-serving something they do not have. It gives a certain material reality to the absence of cream, milk, which is denied any symbolic support. This is what Alenka Zubanjik, in her brilliant analysis of this sequence, calls a materiality of nothing or a, material, or a materiality of the spectrum. It is the first proposition of this paper that the comic is fundamentally dependent upon this emergence of nothing in reality. And one has to make the difference between the idea of reality and the Laconian idea of the real that Kumta so brilliantly uh, proposed in the morning. So it is, uh, the, the idea of the comic is fundamentally dependent upon this emergence of the nothing in, in reality, which is to say it's irreducible materiality. We have to make a crucial distinction here of an idea of nothing as something, nothing which is rendered through its symbolic support, like in case of the symbol zero, and our idea of a nothing which insists its materiality as a remainder of nothing, the latter which can be captured in the formula with without, is where we are talking of a negativity or nothing with consequences, as Rubanjik puts it. But we have to accept that our previous example of the joke can very well be taken merely as what it is, a joke or something funny which plays upon certain logical and linguistic idiosyncrasies which is quickly forgotten by the weight of reality or better by the serious value we ascribe to realistic representation. We have to point here that what makes something truly comic not only disturbs the surface of this order of representation, but displays a lack which constitutes such an order of representation in the first place. The comic continuously dislocates or displaces the surface of representation through insisting upon those moments where ordinary objects, actions, operations take on a surplus value precisely because they become material vessels of this constitutive lack. This continuity or movement through interruptions, through disjunctions, a continuity constructed through discontinuity is the form of the truly comic. Of course, one way to perform this kind of a comic stretching is through dialogues, which is very different, as in comic dialogues, which is very different from jokes. In a joke, the punchline, so to speak, or the comic sparkle is generally produced in the end. In a comic dialogue, on the other hand, it begins with this discontinuity and moves from one displacement to another. Consider, for example, the following comic piece. It is a conversation between George W. Bush and Condoleezza Rice. And Condoleezza Rice walks into the Oval Office. George, Condi, nice to see you. What's happening? Sir, I have the report here about the new leader of China, George. Great, lay it on me. Condi. H-U, spell H-U. Who is the new leader of China? 
George, that's what I'm asking. Who is the new leader of China? Condi, yes. George, I mean the fellow's name. Uh, Condi, who? George, the new leader of China. Condi, who? George, the China man. Condi, who is leading China? Uh, George, what are you asking me that for? I'm telling you, who is leading China? George, well, I'm asking you, who is leading China? Condi, that's the man's name. George, that's whose name? Condi, yes. George, will you or will you not tell me the name of the new leader of China? Condi, yes, sir. Yasir? Yasir Arafat is in China? <laughs> and this goes on. This goes on to uh, what George W. Bush says, I am sick of you, uh, get me the uh, uh, general secretary of U, uh, UN. So Condi says, uh, uh, you want coffee? The coffee. <laughs> and then that one. We find here something more than clever money. Two significantly realities are being constructed here through such juxtaposition of homonyms. But the reason they function as comic is because they continue to exclude each other and yet continue to. This continuous synthesis of these junctions is what makes this comic is, is makes this dialogue comic by excellence. In other words, the mechanism of comedy manages to conserve a continuous chain, chain of displacements. All comedies are conservative in this sense because they conserve displacements. But another way in which comedy manages to stretch the momentariness of such discontinuity, in other words, how it refuses to cut the comedy, so to speak, is through the invention of the character. The comic character, as Walter Benjamin famously wrote in his essay Fate and Character, does not express a subjective unity. Hence, it cannot be analyzed psychologically. It is not the sum of its character parts or traits. The comic character is identical with a single trait. Its characteristic is its character. Developing upon this thesis of Benjamin, Alan Kazobanchik proposes that the comic character is always split between the enjoyment of the ego and the desiring ego. The desiring ego of the subject circulating in the symbolic order of representation and a part of the ego, a part of and a part of it, the ego, which always manages to find enjoyment in spite of the ego. A quick example of this is perhaps the best example of this is uh, Zubanji gives this example, which is in the um, uh, in the uh, uh, question that you ask uh, each other, how is it going? So you can very well answer, it's going fine, or I'm fine, or I'm not fine. But you can also answer, which will make perfect sense if you say, how is it going? It is going fine. I, on the other hand, am sick. I, on the other hand, have a headache. I, on the other hand... So it's a perfect example of how there can be a, there is a split, basically, between the, in, in the cells, where a part of yourself can be enjoyed, but another part is seeking enjoyment. It is this split between the order of desire and the order of enjoyment which defines the singularity of the comic subjectivity as composed entirely of a single trait. More often than not, in comedy, this comes as a passionate attachment to a single object. Think of Orgon in Molière's Tartuffe, attached to the enjoyment of Tartuffe's affection, or the miser Harpagon, again in Molière's Pay Miser, who is attached to his will to the extent that he is ready to torture and execute his family, friends, even himself, if he does not find it. Or even Jack Nicholson's character in the Hollywood movie, As Good As It Gets. Or even, uh, 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 or even the Woody Harrelson character in the movie Zombieland, a comic figure roaming the post-apocalyptic landscape in search of a winky, a candy. We can now imagine an elaboration of the Lubitsch joke in a comic scene where the guy insists and goes to ridiculous extent for his coffee without cream while the waiter persists in serving him coffee without milk. The object that the person is attached to, a metonymic object of desire, so to speak, in our case would be something which in itself is lacking, a spectral object which would become the point of attachment of the subject to the knowledge of the other and the field of desire it generates. In other words, not only would the desiring subject lack the object of his desire, 
but the very object of desire circulating in the symbolic order would insist upon its own lack. It is this bringing together of these two mutually exclusive lacks in the comic figure which would sustain the comedy of the coffee, coffee, uh, coffee scene. In other words, in the disjunction between the lack in the desiring subject obsessing after a cup of coffee without cream and a lack which is constitutive of the object itself, a cup of coffee with the absence of cream. The comic character, sorry, the comic character is the very material evidence of such a disjunction. It is in the character that two excluded realities are preserved as a disjunction. The comic subject is constitutively dislocated and therefore it continuously disturbs the symbolic order by exposing the constitutive lack at the heart of representation. In other words, a comic character is a walking disruption. Think of Rowan Atkinson's brilliant invention of the character of Mr. Bean. Mr. Bean does not get involved in a situation which turns out to be disruptive and disorderly. He is the very walking evidence of disruption and it always begins with the disjunction between what he desires and what he gets and ends up enjoying. Again, we come across the idea of a conservation of a disjunction or displacement which becomes the essence of comedy or more specifically, the nature of comic individuation. This is going to be our second proposition, that the form of individuation resulting in the creation of comic subjectivity is always determined by a constitutive disjunction, through which nothing gains a spectral materiality, where the body preserves its constitutive dislocation. Consider, for example, a character which has died on stage and is lying there as a corpse and suddenly it sneezes. That sneeze would return to the body which is no longer there symbolically. A surplus life, so to speak, is what we would try to elaborate through this paper. And it is this fundamental intellectual operation of the conservation of a displacement that we find in comedy which perhaps brings it to such close proximity of the Middle, of the middle Ages. For isn't it true that the very essence of medieval thinking is based upon a disjunction between a spirit of ancient rationality of the Greeks which had to be accommodated under the new spirit of faith, reason conserved yet displaced onto faith. The formidable scholastic tradition of hermeneutics can be summed up by that famous statement of St. Anselm, Fides Qualis Intellectum. Faith seeking reason. However, rather than assuming that the medieval imagination was merely an appropriation of reason by faith, or even the reverse, we can wager a more risky hypothesis. The medieval imagination was constituted by the elements of faith and reason, which were like two excluded totalities, brought together and sustained as a disjunctive synthesis. It is true that the intellectual operation of the Middle Ages was marked by both conservation and displacement. But can we not argue that this mark was precisely the mark of a disjunction? It was what conserved the very discontinuous nature of medieval imagination. And in, in order to explore further the nature of this discontinuity, we need to understand the nature of medieval materialist imagination as captured in its comic traditions. Now when you talk of the comic in the medieval imagination, at least three sequences come. First, the comic tradition inaugurated by the Pauline idea of folly, when in his first letter to the Corinthians he talked of the fools in the cause of Christ. This tradition has given rise to an entire history of folly in the Middle Ages, ranging from actual practices of the Feast of the Fools to an intellectual tradition which continues at least up to Erasmus in the early 16th century when he composed his praise, Praise of Folly. Let us call this the doctrinal tradition of the comic. Unfortunately, we do not have the time to develop this trajectory which needs an exclusive and separate treatment. We can talk about this perhaps in the, uh, the question and Secondly, we have the use of comic devices and techniques as rhetorical tools to ridicule 
the contemporary social order and educate the public about the spiritual ills of particular forms of spiritual and social existence. We find this method particularly strong in the patristic tradition of early Christianity. Let us call this the pedagogic tradition of comedy. Finally, and this is the third moment, finally we have the emergence of the comic which is primarily concentrated in the vernacular literature from, from around 12th century onwards which displays a singular materialist understanding of the world, very different from both the religious drama and the courtly romances of the period. Let us call this the vernacular tradition of the comic which spreads across various comic genres like the medieval vernacular farces, sorties, the Jopartí tradition of the Turbarus. It is the source of the stories of Boccaccio and the spirit of Ravel's creative world. In the following two sections, we will we try to contrast the logic of these latter two traditions, which is the pedagogic and the vernacular traditions, against each other to search for that elusive threshold where the Christian imagination moves into the vernacular. Section 1. The Transcendental Nothing or the Ridiculous Character of Comedy During the 4th century, John Chrysostom wrote a number of treaties against a certain ascetic practice prevalent among believers of his time, which was termed spiritual marriage. This non-legalized and non-sexualized cohabitation of Christian heterosexual couples lacks any positive term which has come down to us from this period. Yet, the ambiguity of the terminology betrays the curious position of these couples who were both respected as genuine ascetics by society and denounced by many of the early church fathers. Chrysostom himself calls the women virgins while designating men as monks who meant to do well but were led astray by their own efforts. What was at stake was a certain idea of liturgy associated with the practice where men were assumed to perform a service as part of a religious duty towards weak and needy women by giving them financial and material support as dictated by the Christian doctrine of charity. It is this idea of equating such a form of life as liturgical that prompts Chrysostom to use certain comic techniques primarily borrowed from the tradition of old comic from old comedy, like that of Aristophanes, as rhetorical devices to express his hostility towards it. Spiritual marriage was seen as a form of life which claimed to be in the name of religious duty. Chrysostom uses the term literature as public service to designate chores performed by married women as well as any act of Christian love or charity, but he refuses to accept this service of women as part of any Christian doctrine of religious duty. Therefore, the main trajectory of Chrysostom's polemics against spiritual marriage is, was to disprove such a way of life as a part of any Christian idea of religious duty. The deployment of the comic technique is therefore a rhetorical strategy to develop an argument which would create the necessary ironical distance separating such a form of life from any idea of Christian subjectivization. Unfortunately, we do not have the time to go into the formal analysis of these writings to show how the treaties remain faithful to the structure of old comedy. Suffice it to say here that true to this form, Chrysostom begins with a plea that his audience should not misjudge, misjudge him if it tends to misrepresent the situation which was a prevalent tradition to invite an audience to a comic debate in the satirical genre of the day. But it is during his supposed display of humility, excusing himself for any excess while inviting them to debate on the proposed newness of spiritual marriage that he betrays the rhetorical ploy behind using such a technique. Chrysostom pauses in the midst of any such anticipated objection to casually announce that surely pleasure must be the only persuasive reason for such a liaison to take place. While the ascetics, that is those who practice uh, spiritual and the defenders of spiritual marriage, would protest that their relation 
with this woman were based upon an enjoyment determined by shared values and outlooks, Chrysostom offers a more insidious and sensualist explanation. He goes on to say that the sensual pleasure of spiritual marriage is perhaps more intense than conventional marriages because of the impossibility of consummation of the marriage. Accepting the mom's argument that intercourse might very well not occur in such relation, he argues that such a state increases sexual pleasure rather than abolishing it. Deferral and displacement, according to Chrysostom, is the true substance of pleasure because, as he argues, and I quote, if even at the moment of intercourse there seems to be no pleasure, since by effecting the union he has extinguished the pleasure, unquote. We see here the quintessentially Christian notion of concupiscence, which extracts desire out of what the ancients termed aphrodisia. Aphrodisia, where distinctions between desire, sexual enactment, enjoyment and pleasure remain internal to the meaning. Foucault reminds us that sexuality in the classical, in the classical world would remain intricately linked with the concept of aphrodisia which was treated as a difficult substance around which sexual norms were devised. With Christianity, however, as we see from Chrysostom's explicit use of the term, pleasure, pleasure comes to be exclusively identified with desire as lack or longing. This offers Chrysostom the necessary logic to give pleasure its sensual connotation, thereby exposing the discrepancy between what the norms say and where the truth lies. And this is very important, this, this uh, masking or this discrepancy. This in turn provides the comic substance of, to the scene. But such an understanding of pleasure as desire, determined by lack, also gives it a deceptive quality. Being able to produce and transmit itself through such seemingly innocuous medium as that of vision, such modus operandi of, of desire had to be constantly kept under mental surveillance. It also makes desire and the element of pleasure involved very similar to theatre in its operation of masking. In this case, hiding or masking pain and the element of longing behind pleasure. Two orders are being imagined here. And two orders are being imagined here. An order of appearance where cohabitation between men and women is seen as form of a spiritual practice. Then, Chrysostom offers another order, the order of reality, where the same practice is seen to be motivated by sexual pleasure. The comic mechanism is deployed to reveal this truth. And this is important, revelation. The pedagogical tradition of comedy during this time is essentially revelatory. It exposes the fact that what is said to belong to a spiritual and universal order actually belongs to the material and subjective reality of personal desire. The comic lies in identifying the incommensurability between an infinite metaphysical order and a finite physical order while the latter poses as the former. This not only affirms a dualist ideology of a divine reality as against a human reality, but insists on the irreconcilability between the two. In the final analysis, Chrysostom uses the comic to call the bluff of something finite which masks itself to be infinite and universal. And being comic, it can function as a rhetorical tool to persuade a collective who would want to be on the side of this truth. This is the pedagogic function of the comic which ridicules spiritual marriage as a form of perversion. Chrysostom's comedy invites us to accept and even be consoled by the limits and boundaries of our finite existence because the human condition is irrevocably finite. However, in Chrysostom, the master signified, so to speak, is never finite but the divine narrative of an infinite God. Therefore, when he exposes the finitude and subjective contingency of material existence, it is always in the name of an infinite reality. The contradiction and the impasses which generate the comic are used to reaffirm 
the dualist logic of two separate orders. The gross materialism that Chrysostom seeks to expose through the comic unravels a dualist problem of a metaphysics of infinity and a physics of finitude. This is the use of the comic to propagate a Christian view of the world as an alienated reality, which is separated from its own substance, which lies elsewhere in a divine way. And it is this uh, proposition, that a metaphysics of infinity and a physics of finitude, which we will try to show in the next section, which gets turned, which gets overturned by a new proposition of the comic, which primarily Alain de Zubanchik gives. Moreover, we can reflect this entire understanding of the comic as a problem of the metaphorization of theatre. Though we do not have the time to develop this here, it can be argued that the pedagogic function of the comic is part of a general operation of metaphorization, where the metaphor of theatre is used to denounce and undermine an actually existing theatrical potential. The metaphorizing of comedy therefore starts to correspond, correspond with the abolition of any materialist understanding of comedy. Let us then pass on to the other side, to a materialist understanding of the comic, of the comic, to the concrete example of a medieval comic play. And this is the last section, section 2. The immanent nothing or the cracked eye. <clears throat> Written in the last quarter of the 13th century by Adam de la Halle, the French vernacular play, La Jour de la, de la Foy, which is roughly translated in two translations are there. One is called Leaves of Folly and the other is called Play, play, play of Madness. But it's not the literal translation, of course. The French vernacular play, La Jour de la Foy, has remained a testament <coughs> to the enigma of the comic style that medieval Europe produced. Written in the emerging scholastic climate, the play has puzzled critics for ages, generating responses which vary from calling it an improvisational curiosity written by self-indulgent students to a record of the emerging self-consciousness of 12th century Renaissance. It is, however, in the nature of deployment of language and the development of the dialogues that the play exposes its metaphysical complexities and, as we shall try to argue, a materialist unconscious symptomatic of the age. This learned anti-clerical play tells the story of Adam, an inhabitant of Arras, who wants to renounce his marriage to Marie and go to Paris in order to take up the habit of the clerk. Of course, from the very beginning, we find the shift in the treatment of the Adamic nostalgia for innocence. As compared to, for example, a vernacular play like La Mystery de Adam, The Mystery of Adam, which is part of a paraliturgical series of plays. In case of the uh, Jean de la Foy, uh, Jean de la Foy has moved from a transcendental locus to a more terrestrial setting of a historical Adam caught in the domestic drama of the frustrated husband who wants to return to a more worthy life of the mind as a student in Paris. However, it is in its use of language and the development of the dialogues that the play usurps any legitimate use of stable language mediating between the inner world of consciousness and the outer world of reality. The series of displacements that the play unleashes sweeps away any possibility of coherent function of signification, which in turn destroys a dream of composite character or positive subject. What remains is a series of shifters, testifying to all moments of usurpation of meanings crowding the play, making it impossible to assign any definite meaning to the text. In the beginning, as Eugene Vaughan, a brilliant French medievalist, points out, Language seems to function through its principle of signification when Adam declares of his decision to abandon his marriage to become a monk. The conscious self as the master of his decision seems to use language to convey his mind and therefore and thereby bridge the gap between the rational human mind and the world outside. Adam closes his opening declaration with the famous proverb, can I quote, it still appears from the thesis what the pop was. And here begins all the semantic mischief. 
At first glance, the use of the pot metaphor at this stage seems obvious enough. Despite the fragmentation of Adam's life because of his marriage to Mary and Aras, there seems to be definite hope of a collecting together of the shattered pieces, a gathering of the self in anticipation of a future wholeness. But given that Adam would never be able to leave Aras and his dreams would remain far from fulfilling, the use of the metaphor seems to bear a foreboding of an impending dissolution. But in the play, such a theological tradition of using the pot metaphor to underscore the contingent and finite nature of, humans ex of human existence would undergo what we might call a materialist dissipation. Returning many times in the course of the play, the motive, the motive would finally be used in its stark literalness to the effect of causing what Barnes calls a demetaphorization in the course of the play. As we know, the metaphor of the pot standing for the self has a rich tradition in Christian theology, starting from St. Paul who asks in the letter to the Romans, and I quote, but who are you, a man, to answer back to God? Will what is modern say to its molder, what have you made me, the, why have you made me thus? Like the metaphor of Theatra Mundi, which expressed the elusive and deceptive nature of finite existence, so does the pot metaphor talk of the finite and contingent life as part of a dualist logic which would oppose the fragmented multiplicity of the finite self to the unified to the unified divine consciousness. As we as we have seen before. Such a dualist regime would become the condition of possibility of an upward movement. As a result of a progressive metaphorization of the world, all worldly multiplicities would be subsumed under the logic of a divine one. But in this anti clerical play, we find an inverse movement when the absolute, that is the one, comes crashing down to the worldly stage being broken into a thousand pieces like the pot which is hurled on stage and it is literally done on stage by the end of the play which it is impossible to put back together. The use of the proverb of the broken pot no longer has a fixed metaphorical meaning but as Vance remarks, a shifter prophesizing and this is very important the uh, metaphor becomes a shifter prophesizing the destiny of writing playing itself out in the play. Unquote. From this perspective, the entire trajectory of the play can be compared to the metaphor of the broken paw. The broken paw becomes a metaphor for the formal structure of the play which is fragmented and decentered. Conversely, the play does not simply represent the metaphor of the broken paw as part of its content but in representing the metaphor of the broken pot, it represents its own configuration. In other words, with the metaphor of the broken pot, the play becomes the content of what it itself represents. And here things become more complicated. Two comic movements are involved here. First, the metaphor of the pot expresses a structure of a play within a play. This is not quintessentially comic. We find the structure of a play within the play in many of Shakespeare's um, uh, dramas, which are not comic for that matter. Uh, what is comic by excellence is that this knowledge of the play in the end comes to us not as a metaphor but material. The last scene testifies to that knowledge being attached to an object, giving that object a surplus value. The actual hurling of the pot on stage does not signify that the play is finally like that broken pot, fragmented. Rather, it makes the pot into a surplus object which not only stands for the metaphor of life but is metonymically attached, metonymically attached to, the, to the play as the knowledge of the play itself. It has a double movement. A. It functions as a surplus object of knowledge of the play and B, but at the same time it is inserted as an object within the actual play. This technique of using a metonymic surplus object corresponds to those impossible objects which frequently crowd the comic world. Moreover, 
from the point of view of individuation a related dimension opens up under these circumstances the subjective reality which makes the comic world poss possible does more than simply subvert the universal essence of a coherent and totalizing subject if all subjectivity is broken into a thousand pieces in their rapid descent onto the comic stage it is the dull the crazy boy the quintessential fool who remains intact unscathed in his nonsense in a world where men are caught in their own deception the fool happily declares that he is the king and where men remains a byproduct of men's as well and where women remain a byproduct of men's fantasy and language he declares himself a married man but he agree with and this thing but he agree with wants that through his madness the fool illustrates more than the mere failure of human will to signify his progressive desire to degrade language coincides with a certain emergence of a comic subjectivity where and i this is a term from zubanji where the work of the uh, which she borrows from hegel uh, where the work of the negative so to speak finds its own absolute moment in other words a certain materiality of nothingness emerges to the deployment of language here the figure of the fool becomes a universal in itself by a centrifugal deployment of language which paradoxically acts as a centripetal force which attracts towards itself attracting the absolute to itself rendering it concrete within itself but also exposing it to its own contingency its own localization the fool declares himself the prince of poets who can transform words and objects through his absurd will by adding an l to the to the to the french word and this is old french uh, the pu uh, the uh, current french is pom pom the term no, of apple the, the old uh, pom 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 the term is uh, apple and pom is apple but the old french was pu p u m -E, in english so by adding an l to the word apple pu he makes the apple he is eating at picardy into a feather a pu and flies off to uh, that flies off to paris like a mere word or abstract language here we should not see the two words separately but as a, but as a disjunctive synthesis of two terms which nevertheless cannot be distinguished like a mobile strip pium pium apple feather are the two sides of the same surface of language on which the profound and the sublime the abstract and the concrete are conserved the finite heaviness of the apple and the infinite lightness of the feather are open up a contradiction which constitutes the figure of the fool in sure as a finite figure which is nevertheless the origin of something which cannot be reduced to simple finitude apple undermines the lightness of feather pulling it towards itself pulling it down towards itself as much as feather induces lightness into the concreteness of apple the comic moment par excellence is to sustain this disjunction in the character of the fool who is composed of this constitutive dislocation the comic operation succeeds only through bringing into presence this missing link which in this case connects the concrete and the abstract but not as something not as a signifier of the connection which is missing the comic character and the language he deploys is the sheer physicality of this dislocation the comic fool is the very materiality of nothing sustained only through the subject's constitutive displacement comedy in destroying all formal universal assumptions and exposing the play of caprice of chance individuality does not completely do away with universals but rather undergoes a radical shift of perspective as a result the negativity of comic structure and the contradiction to which it exposes itself becomes inscribed onto the comic structure as a universal to use zubanchik's words in comedy and i quote the universal is on the side of undermining the universal and take the cliched comic example of a mighty king sleeping on a banana peel 
It is not the sudden realization of the contingent reality of material and mortal existence of man behind the crown which is funny. It becomes funny when in spite of falling, the man gets up and continues to work, still believing himself to be the king. It is here, in this belief, that the universal idea of monarchy, which is contained in the materiality of the human body, comes to us as nothing, as a wit without. It makes us realize that in his belief to be the king, he is nothing but a silly old man, silly old human being walking. According to such an idea of what can be called universal at work, one can distinguish between, as Rupanjik invites us to do, false comedy and true comedy. All those comedies where in spite of the display of contradiction, the abstract universal and the, con and the concrete do not swap the places. Rather, they are reconfirmed in their fixed positions, being related externally by such contradiction can be argued to be false comedies. Our discussion of Chrysostom follows this pattern of a conservative comedy which conserves the fixed position of the transcendent and the immanent order, thereby introducing dualism between the two. In true comedy, on the other hand, as we try to show, the abstract and the concrete switch places while being held together and conserved to something like a disjunctive synthesis. I'll just give you a picture. If the conservation of a disjunction is the essence of a comic mode of thinking, and if such an operation of thought brings it suspiciously close to the intellectual activity of the Middle Ages, then we can perhaps talk of an actuality of the Middle Ages. In this age of late capitalism, in the aftermath of some centuries of high bourgeois heritage, we also need a new interpretation of classical culture in order to situate ourselves in relation to a new collective imagination. Much like the medieval monk or perhaps the Turbadu, why not? We need to ask ourselves how to make sense of our reality caught between our individualist desire for aesthetic enjoyment and a generic desire for a new vision of humanity. The actuality of the Middle Ages, which to our understanding can very well be proposed as a comic actuality, may provide a few references for such a theoretical possibility. Thank you.